Uh, my name is Alice Doherty, I'm a PhD student at the School of English um, and I'm going to show you today, I do some research using the eye tracker um, and I'm going to just demonstrate that to you today with my friend Emily from the School of Psychology. Hello. <laughs> yep, this is called an eye tracker. It's a seriously clever piece of kit. So you have two cameras that we use. This one here um, monitors your eye movement um, and this camera at the front here uses the sensors that you can see on the screen to um, calculate your head position. So what I'm going to do is um, set this up on Emily so you can just have a look at how the eye tracker works. Let's do it. Okay. So I'm just going to tighten this up, Emily. And now we'll just set up the experiment. Now what I'm doing is just um, setting the experiment to run on this computer. Okay, so what we need to do first of all to set up the camera um, is to just make sure that the eye is in the right position so that the camera can track it. Okay, so I'm just looking at getting that into focus. Good. So the way that the camera works, um, it detects uh, dark patches in the eye. Um, so you can see that it's detecting the, the pupil here, the black spot of the pupil, and it's also detecting some of the eyelash. So that's looking like a nice image and we can now get it calibrated. That dot's going to move around the screen, Emily. When it moves, I'd like you to look straight at it and to keep looking at it until it moves again. Okay. And as you can see, the, ca the um, camera is picking up pretty well whereabouts on the screen um, Emily was looking at every single time point. So we're now going to um, output the experiment onto that computer. So what we have on, on this screen here is um, Emily's eye position as she's reading the text. So this, is, this is a really accurate system and you can get some very, like, very reliable data. Um, so it, it can pretty much isolate what specifically what character on the screen you're looking at. So it's an incredibly accurate piece of kit. So in this lab, we're really interested in what uh, is stored in the brain in terms of words and how words are processed. And in particular, we're interested in how that works when someone is reading or listening in a second language. So this experiment that you've been watching Emily do is on idioms or collocations. So this paragraph that she was reading um, had the phrase pain in the neck. There are also phrases like kick the bucket which can be used literally, so you can literally kick a bucket, or it can mean to die, you can literally have a pain in the neck, or someone can be a bother to you. So we're looking at how people understand those phrases. So we can tell, first of all, how long someone spends reading. So if you spend a long time, obviously it means you're having trouble processing. Um, and also, if you're having trouble, you usually go back to other places in the text. Why use this really expensive piece of kit to figure that out, though, what they're doing? Why don't you just say? Do you know what kick the bucket means? Well, in a lot of cases, the non-native speakers say that they're familiar with these idioms, but from the processing speed and the fact that they have to go back and look for contextual cues, we can tell that their offline um, assessment of their own proficiency doesn't actually match what they're doing in the experiments. In a set of experiments, we're looking at um, two or three word expressions, so things like salt and pepper or fish and chips that as native English speakers we use every day. And we always say fish and chips, we don't say chips and fish. Um, we always say salt and pepper, we don't say pepper and salt. So we're looking at how non-native speakers process these. So in cases where you also say fish and chips in your language, we see that processing is um, fast and like native speakers. However, Russians say pepper and salt instead of salt and pepper. So we see that their processing time is slow. Even though they understand what it means, we can see that they're having difficulty with this because it's in the wrong order. The tractor will be repaired by Donald Duck bit by bit. He is standing in the other field. Donald needs to cross the road to get to the tractor. Basically, we have an inanimate object um, in all of our pictures, like a tractor, and we have an animate character like Donald Duck. Um, and when they hear tractor, Emily should be looking at the tractor. When she hears Donald Duck, she should be looking at Donald Duck. And then the next sentence crucially starts with he. All of our English speakers, when they hear he, know that he has to refer to Donald Duck 
So they look at Donald Duck. Um, we did the same experiment with uh, native Dutch speakers who are highly proficient in English, so they speak English very well. He, in Dutch, can refer to the tractor or Donald Duck. Now, if you ask any Dutch speaker in English, he is on the other side of the field, 100% correct. They know he has to refer to Donald Duck. But the, the key question here is, does the fact that they know Dutch influence where they look when they hear the English sentences? And what we see is that when they hear he in English, they look at the tractor instead of Donald Duck. So their knowledge of Dutch is influencing temporarily what they think he refers to. We're looking at how knowledge of your native language influences processing in English. And again, if we can find areas where you're having trouble, we can come up with ways to help non-native speakers be more efficient when they're in an academic context like the university.